Parsha 101, Parsha Snoach. This, this Parsha takes place 10 generations after uh, the now the world has strayed, people have strayed from the original intent of creation. They're, they are descending into idolatry and not just that, but the land is filling up with Hamas, with corruption, robbery, that it wasn't just that they were sinning against God, but they were sinning against each other. The way that they were treating each other was the final straw that brought about the flood that was basically factory reset of the world. And so the name of the Torah portion comes from the first verse of the Torah portion. These are the descendants of Noach. Noach was a righteous man, complete in his generation. And commentaries look at this phrasing and say, what is in his generation? So yes, despite the generation he lived in, he was still a righteous man. Others say, no, it's just compared to his generation, he was righteous. But if he would have been living in a generation like Abraham, he might not have measured up. But one way or the other, there are some important things that are going on here that the Torah is specifically articulating Noach's righteousness, talking about in praise of this. And it's a lesson that when there are people worthy of admiration and worthy of being looked up to, it, this should be articulated specifically before children say, oh, this is a great person, someone worth looking up to for these and these reasons, this is their righteousness, etc. because that then will inspire uh, other pe the children toward this because that the ideal is for children to be making the right decisions and to be good people. That's what the ultimate aspiration is. Also, speech will activate activates these good qualities. So speech in negative effect could bring out the negative qualities, God, God forbid, but in speaking about the good qualities, it's a way to strengthen and bring them to the fore. Now, whether whatever this, you know, Noach being righteous in his generation, one way or the other, we could see that Noach was one man who, despite his entire generation of corruption, he was a righteous person and he made the right decision and he walked with God. So the rest of us living in a generation that might seem to be filled with turmoil, etc., but we are not one. There are many of us who are trying to live the right way, etc. So we can take strength from this and know that we can succeed in doing the right things. Then it says that Noah was the father of Shem, Ham, and Yafes. Shem would be, Shem is where all the, basically where the Jewish people are going to come from. Ham and Yafes, Yafes was, Yafes was actually the oldest. Now we have Ham and we'll see what happens with them. That, okay, so then the land is filled with, with corruption, idolatry, licentiousness. Um, it even says to the point where the animals were crossbreeding, as there's cross species relations going on, not just crossbreeding, but in, in an extreme sense. So that God's like, that's it, factory setting. Re default is to factory setting. And so he tells Noah, build an ark, and I want you to build it in the open. People should see what you're doing, and I want them to ask you. Also, you're going to build it yourself because so that it should take a long time. Don't get all your sons involved in this, not because they shouldn't be part of it, because we want to maximize the amount of time this is going to take you to build it so that people will have plenty of time to ask you, what are you doing? And you can tell them, God's going to flood the world. And this shouldn't inspire them to repent. Spoiler, we know that it didn't happen. It was only Noah's family that was saved, but this was the intent of it. And you're going to make this ark out of cypress wood, and you're going to make compartments for all the different animals and, and birds and creations on all them that are, that are upon the earth, and caulk it in and out with pitch because it's going to be it's going to be submerged in water, so you got to make sure that it's not going to leak or anything. You're also going to make a side entrance, not don't open it from the hatch on top so that the water shouldn't flood in. Even though he did make the roof was tapered and there was there was a skyline and they also said there was a very luminous stone that was put for for a lot of light. The measurement of the ark, the length of it was 300 cubits, which is about 144 meters slash 471 feet. The width was 50 cubits, about 24 meters and 77 feet, and the height was 30 cubits, about 14.4 meters and 47 feet. There were three levels, three decks to it. The uppermost was where the people were, the middle was where the animals were, and the bottom was with trash and garbage and stuff. And then God says, Noah, I'm gonna flood the whole world. Everything and everyone, everything's gonna perish. And, but I'm making a covenant with you that you are going to live and your family will survive. Um, there was a commandment here that the men and women were gonna live separately. This is not a time uh, for cohabitation now because the world is being destroyed. And then Hashem also says, take two of each species and male and female take them because with these the world will be repopulated there was actually some there's an interesting thing about what happened in the teva was so a little bit of a glimpse of messianic times because despite all the animals and creatures and everything that were on board the wolf was with the lamb and the wolf did not eat the lamb there's no trouble in that regard from the animals everybody lived peacefully on board the ark 
which is also later on when God says leave the ark. It was like, even if the animals don't want to leave, you got to force them out because they know that once they get out there, the world is going to, the nature of the world is going to take over and predators become predators again, etc. But the world is supposed to be inhabited and lived in. So they had this, this peacefulness despite the flood that was raging. And even the word, word for flood that, that's been used in Mabel comes from the word of, 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 like hit the bell to, to confuse because sometimes the floods of the world can confuse our own minds to what's really important. And so we got to clear it out and make sure that we're focusing on the right things. Now, Hashem also tells Noah to gather all the edible foods because, well, miraculously, no food went bad, but you got to make sure that you're going to be able to feed everybody and everything. Noah and his family took care of all these animals. Imagine however many species exist in the world, however many species animals and creatures and everything, and they had to sustain all of them. Noach did as, as he was commanded, and it took 120 years to build the ark. And there's something miraculous that happened, is that all the animals, the pairs, came on their own. Which part was also that because there were animals who were engaged in this cross-species relations, God made sure that only that the animals that behaved themselves basically were part of this. But they were pairs of each, except the kosher animals, which the Torah actually very specifically does not say kosher, not kosher, or pure and impure. The kosher, the, the Torah very specifically calls them the animals that are pure animals and the animals that are not pure animals. Just kind of a roundabout way of saying the impure animals, which is just the Torah being, like we don't have to speak God, is what the Torah is kind of saying. So on the 10th of the month of Cheshvan, so the second month of the year, starting if you start from the count of when the year actually starts, Hashem tells Noach, go into the ark. Also, when it comes to the kosher animals, there were going to be seven pairs of the animals because some of them would later be offered as sacrifices, but there were going to be seven pairs and two, two of all the other species. So they go into the ark on the 10th and it says in seven days, it's going to start to rain. And why seven days? So commentaries say it's actually when Metzushelach, Methuselah, he had passed away and they were sitting Shiva for a week. He was a righteous person. He died before the flood occurred. And now they had to sit Shiva and then they could, uh, then the flood can happen. And then it was going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. Anyways, Noah is 600 years when this is all going down. And the well springs are going to burst open and the floodgates of heaven are going to open up and everything is just going to be drowned and, well, drowned. And at first the rain came slowly and people were like, hey, wait, maybe this Noah guy knew what he was talking about kind of thing. But of course nobody repented still. And even then it was like, is the world really going to be destroyed? Well, spoiler, yes, the answer was yes. But the rain began slowly before everything just burst open. And also, it, the Torah very specifically says that Noah and all the animals and everybody entered during the day because there were people go, oh, this Noah guy, we're going to stop him from going in. And uh, of course, nobody stopped him. So everything floods, everything bursts open. It rains for 40 days and night, complete nonstop. The whole, worth, the whole world gets flooded. Only those in the Teva and the Ark survive. And the water, it says, rose 15 cubits above the highest mountain peak. So the bottom half, the bottom section of the Ark, 11 cubits up, was submerged in water. Up, up, that up, there was a lot of water. All creation says all life perished up from the earth. The only creations that did not serve, that did not, whether were not destroyed were the fish in the sea. Because there's a whole thing about how fish, because they're surrounded by their life force versus animals that live on their life force. It's a different spiritual thing. So they're more aware of kind of where they're getting their life from because the fish are, are in water. The fish were not part of any of the sin or corruption that occurred on land. So the fish actually stayed alive, but everything else perished, died, gone, total wipeout. So it rains for four days and 40 nights, that going. So the 10th of the month of Cheshvan, the Hebrew month of Cheshvan, they went into the ark. Seven days later on the 17th, the rain, everything opens up and it starts to rain. 40 days later, 40 full days and nights later, the 28th of Kislev, it subsides. But still the waters were surging for another 150 days. So that brings us all the way to the month of Iyar, the 29th of Iyar. From the first of Sivan, Sivan is the month when the Torah is given. So theoretically, be after Hanukkah, after Pesach, which didn't exist yet, but all those things, the waters begin to recede. Then on the 17th of the month of Sivan, the Ark comes to rest on the mountain of Ararat. And they're like, okay, things are changing now. On the 1st of Av, which a couple months later, the mountain peaks across the world are starting to become visible because the flood waters are receding. And on the 10th of Elul, which is now coming up back upon Rosh Hashanah time, kind of, Noah opens up the window and he looks at it and he's like, okay, it's time to start thinking about repopulating the world, basically. So he opens up the window and he sends out the raven. The raven just circles the ark, it doesn't go anywhere. So it's okay, plan B. 
about a week later, so on the 18th of El, he sends out the, the, the dove gets sent out. It flies back and it returns. She says, okay, there's some, you know, we have to wait for it to recede a little bit more. Seven days later, he sends out the dove again and returns with an olive leaf. So he says, if it's coming back with an olive leaf, that means something, something is starting to grow. The world is starting to become visible again. And then seven days later, he sends the dove out again, and this time it does not return. So the dove has found a place to live now. And at this point, we're actually in the Hebrew year of 1657, Noach now removes the covering from the ark, and he sees that the whole earth is drying, drying up. And by the 27th of Cheshvan, so it's a full solar year later, 365 days later, the earth is dry enough for people to people and animals to live on it again. And now God tells Noach, Tzeim and Teva, leave the ark. You kind of had this, despite what was going on, there was this peaceful existence in the ark. And also despite the fact that you had to care for these animals day and night, but the fact that predator, there was no, they were not fighting each other and the wolf and the lamb were together, etc. It's time to get out. You got to tell the animals to get out. It's time for the world to be repopulated and to be lived in again, resettled. Tell the animals to go out and to be fruitful, to multiply and fill up the earth again. Noch now also offer sacrifices from the extra of the kosher animals that he had brought. And Hashem sees, smells the sacrifices and he says, never again am I gonna curse the soil because of humanity. I'm never gonna destroy the whole world again. God makes this vow. He says, all, as long as the earth is gonna to continue to exist, all the seasons will exist with it as well. So planting season, harvest season, cold and the heat and in the summer and the winter. And and then he, and then again, all the beasts, the birds and the fish, everything, all the plants and all this, he tells Noah, these are all gonna be yours. For eating, the dread of you will be upon them. Until now, people were not allowed to shech to kill animals for eating. If an animal had died, they could kind of eat the meat. Now, God gave Noah and his family permission and instruction that you're allowed to be eating meat now and animals and and etc. However, you can't eat no blood of an animal, which is repeated often in the Torah, and an animal has to be fully killed before you eat. You can't just, it's called a you can't just take a limb off a living animal. You have to make sure the animal is actually dead before you try to eat it. And it goes into a few other things here about bloodshed. I'm gonna take accounting for bloodshed that occurs, etc. If a person sheds blood, the courts have to take his blood for it. There's capital punishment basically because man was creating the image of God. And so commentaries say that it diminishes the image of God upon the earth when one person murders another. Basically setting out the rules, like remember all that terrible stuff that was going on before, make sure none of this is repeated. And they said that the sons of Noah took upon themselves, okay, we understand what was going on. We better make sure like licentious behavior is out. All that kind of stuff is out. Idolatry was the one thing they still kind of faltered in. Eventually they would return to, some would, some would return to that as a general idea, the way they treated each other was a much better. They learned, they did learn the lesson from the flood in that regard. And then God says to Noah, I'm going to establish the covenant with you that never again will I flood the earth. As in the earth is never again going to be destroyed by flood waters, which uh, those who believe that the uh, one day all the waters are just going to flood it, they're all, the whole earth, who obviously have not learned this partial yet. And then God also says that what's going to be the sign of the covenant is I'm going to put the rainbow in the clouds. So... There might be regions of the earth that I might get upset about and the clouds are going to start coming in to look like it's going to start flooding again. Then the rainbow is going to come and it's going to remind me, hey, you're not supposed to flood. Don't flood the earth anymore. And so that's why there's kind of like a interesting outlook in Judaism on the rainbow. It's not specifically considered a good thing. You know, it's a beaut it's, it's very pretty with all the colors, but it's considered a reminder of the flood where God's saying like, hey, remember, like literally almost a memento mori, mori, like, hey, don't flood the earth again. So they say there are certain people that during their time, the generations were so righteous that not a rainbow was seen. That would be the King Chizkia, who would be a king much later on. And also during the times of the Rashbi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, whose yard side is their celebration, that's like Bomer, they say in their generations, no rainbow was seen. And that's said in praise of them. So indicating that the rainbow is not specifically a good thing to be seeing. There are some people who kind of turn away from it. We don't specifically do that. There is a bracha that we say on the rainbow, that when a rainbow is seen, rainbow in the sky is seen. There's a bracha that God remember the covenant that you made and remember that uh, don't flood the earth again, basically. Now, after all this happens, there's still, Noah and his sons are still kind of hesitant to, be, to repopulate the world. How do we know there's not gonna be a flood that occurs? Which is where all these reassurances are coming in of, yes, you gotta be fruitful and multiply and repopulate the world. That is your job, that's what you gotta do now. 
and so after all this, it says that Noach plants a vineyard. He gets drunk and he passes out. Canaan, who's his grandson, who's the son of Ham, the third son, sees what happens and he tells his, fa- his father and his father comes in and commentaries say what happens is that he that Ham now that he rapes and castrates his father and part of it is that he's basically jealous he's like look Cain and Abel they couldn't figure out how to populate how to divide the earth or whatever and now God tells Noah be fruitful and multiply he's going to start having a bunch more kids and that's going to cut into my share of the earth basically of course when Noah finds out what happens he curses Canaan and you're going to be a slave to your father's brothers. You're going to be a slave to your... He just total curses him. And he also praises Shem and Yafes because when they found out what had happened, they take... Uh, well, Shem was kind of in the lead of it. So he gets the more praise for it. And Yafes was with him that they took a garment to... And they walk backwards and they cover over their father. So they don't see him in his drunken slosh naked state. In the state that he's in, they don't look upon him like this, but they, they show honor by covering him up. So they are blessed and praised for what they have done now so after all this Noah lives another 350 years he passed away at the year at the age of 950 and then it, the Torah now goes through the descendants his descendants the descendants of the children which become the 70 primary nations of the world and all them they were supposed to they were going to divide up the, the land they were all supposed to go out and settle the world these 70 nations which that's why they're the primary nations of the world um, then it talks about, actually, it slips in when it's going through the, the nations. It talks about Nimrod, who it says he was a mighty hunter before God. He's a grandson of Ham, but he's part of Ham's descendants. Um, it talks about he's going to rally the masses to rebel against Hashem. And he was seated in Babylon. That was his place. And then it tells us Shame's kids, um, which eventually you're going to get to the 10 generations of Abraham, which the Torah portion is going to end off with. And it does like a whole counting that you could see when we talk about the 70 nations. She- Yafes is nations 1 through 14. So 14 nations there. Ham was nations 15 to 44. And Shame is nations 45 to 70. So when you look at the 70 nations of the world, that's how many each of the kids had. Then it also talks about, we're going to get to the Tower of, ba- of, of Babel now, of Babel now. Migdal Babel, where it's all the population of Babel. All the population spoke one language and they all had a common cause so unlike the generation of the flood that they couldn't get along with each other even though they're about they want to figuratively well they want to literally rebel against god but they got along with each other which is advantage so god's like you got the first part you got one part right about getting along with each other but you're not you forgot the second part of like the reason why you're supposed to be getting along with each other so nimrod convinces everybody we're gonna build this massive tower we're gonna go up to heaven we're gonna challenge god's domain there and also we're going to protect ourselves from the earth ever getting flooded again. This huge, huge tower that you know took ages and ages to build. It says in the year 1996, God descends to see what's going on. And it's a lesson that a judge should never pass judgment before he actually examines the case thoroughly. And he looks at what's going on and he's like, no, nah, no, nah, I don't think so. And that's why it's called Babel, Babel, because it's kind of like with the word of the Mabo, Balal Hashem, that it got mixed up. All the languages got mixed up. So each clan now speaks its own language. And because of this, they're not communicating with each other anymore. So they all disperse and go and sell the earth, which is what they were originally supposed to do. It was not specifically just all huddle up in one area. They were supposed to repopulate and go out among, and go out and settle the land, the earth. Um, then it goes back and goes back to going through shame. It's going to go now through the 10 generations from Noach to Avraham. And... It continues um, listing all the children that were born there, and it talks about how we could see that the people are starting to live less because the life expectancy is changing now. The Noah lived 950 years. Shame lived 600 years. And by the time you get to Avram's father, Terach, he lived 200 years. So there was definitely a change, a physical change that occurred in the earth during the flood that changed a lot for humanity. So. We see going through descendants, you see the lifespans are getting shorter. So it talks about also how shame is starting to see that the people are starting to turn to idolatry again. So him and his great grandson, Aver, found they had started yeshiva to like a well school of learning, basically, to keep teaching the word of God and the, the, like the monotheism, I guess you could say. The Avraham was going to go out and spread it, but here they were keeping... They were keeping the school alive. They were keeping that those who want to come and learn and get the facts straight could come to them for that. Then finally, eventually, we get to Terach. 
this descendant Terach. Terach has three sons, Avram, Nachar, and Haran. Haran, who is the father of Lot, and Haran, who is the father of Lot. Avram was born in the Hebrew year 1948. Everything now, it doesn't tell us specifically in the Torah, this is stuff that was going to be in the, like in the Medrash and, and other sources speak about this, the whole thing that happens with the fiery furnace, because Avram goes and he smashes all of his father's idols, says, what is this, you know, ridiculousness, there's only one God, etc. And then Tarach brings Avram to Nimrod, and Nimrod is like, what have you done? Oh, you believe in this God? Well, let him save you. He throws him into the fiery furnace, and of course, Avram survives. All this goes on here. It talks about how Avram marries Sarai, who is also known as Yisko. It's another name for her, etc., etc. Basically, Tarach is like, hey, we got to get out of this place. We can't keep up with these idolaters anymore. We got to move. So Tarach moves his family. And in this time, that's when Avram and Sarai, who will be Avram and Sarah, their names haven't been changed yet, Avram and Sarai start to spread the word of God. They start actively going out to teach other people monotheism that there's only one God. And the Torah portion ends up with Terach passing away in the year 205. And next week's Torah portion will continue with the story of Avraham.